The Zeitgeist Movement Defined Essay 13, Post-Scarcity, Trends, Capacity, and Efficiency, Part 3. Clean Water. Given that the human body can only survive a few days without fresh water, making this most basic resource abundantly available to all is critical. Likewise, it is the backbone of many industrial production methods, including agriculture itself. Fresh water is naturally occurring water on the Earth's surface in ice sheets, ice caps, glaciers, icebergs, bogs, ponds, lakes, rivers and streams, and underground as groundwater in aquifers and underground streams. Streams. Of all the water on Earth, 97% of it is saline and not directly consumable. According to the World Health Organization, about 2.6 billion people, half the developing world, lack even a simple improved latrine, and 1.1 billion people have no access to any type of improved drinking source of water. As a direct consequence, 1.6 million people die every year from diarrheal diseases, including cholera, attributable to lack of access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation, and 90% of these are children under 5, mostly in developing countries. 160 million people are infected with schistomiasis, causing tens of thousands of deaths yearly. 500 million people are at risk of trachoma, from which 146 million are threatened by blindness and 6 million are visually impaired. Intestinal helminths Ascariasis, trichuriasis, and hookworm infection are plaguing the developing world due to inadequate drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene, with 13.3 million suffering from high-intensity intestinal helminths infections. There are around 1.5 million cases of clinical hepatitis A every year. According to the United Nations, by 2025, an estimated 1.8 billion people will live in areas plagued by water scarcity, with two-thirds of the world's population living in water-stressed regions. As with most all of the world's current resource problems, it is an issue of both poor management and a lack of industrial application. From the standpoint of management, the amount of water wasted in the world due to pollution, overuse, and inefficient infrastructure is enormous. About 95% of all water that enters most people's homes goes back down the drain in one shot. A systems-based solution to optimize this use is to design kitchens and bathrooms so they recapture water for different purposes. For example, the water running through a sink or shower can be made available for a toilet. Various companies have slowly put such ideas to practice recently, but overall, most infrastructures do nothing of the sort as far as reuse schemes. The same is true of large commercial buildings, which can create reuse networks throughout the whole structure, coupled with capture of rainwater for other purposes etc. Water pollution is another problem which affects both developed and developing nations on many levels. The American Environmental Protection Agency EPA estimates that 850 billion gallons of untreated discharges waste flow into water bodies actually contributing to over 7 million illnesses each year. The World Center for Water Management estimates that only about 10 to 12 percent of wastewater in Latin America is treated properly. Mexico City, for example, exports its untreated wastewater to local farmers. While the farmers value this because the water increases crop yields, the wastewater is heavily contaminated with pathogens and toxic chemicals, representing a serious health risk for both farmers and consumers of the agricultural products grown in this area. In India, major cities discharge untreated wastewater into the bodies of water that serve as their drinking water. Delhi, for example, discharges wastewater directly into the Yamuna River, the source of drinking water for some 57 million people. Solutions to this problem, in part, must address the issue of the vast inefficiency likely driven by the monetary limitations of most governments to institute proper waste systems, coupled with an industrial design imperative to include reuse system techniques to better preserve and utilize our existing resources. That aside, the most notable broad solution to compensate for these emerging problems 
to facilitate not only an alleviation of the current water problems affecting over 2 billion people, but also to transcend into a condition of relative abundance of fresh water for all humans is to utilize modern A, purification, and B, desalination systems, both on the macro-industrial and micro-industrial scale. A, purification. Advancements in water purification have been accelerating rapidly with many technological variations of approach. Perhaps one of the most efficient today is what is called ultraviolet, UV disinfection. This process is highly scalable, low energy, and works quickly. According to engineer Ashok Gajil, inventor of portable UV systems, quote, in terms of energy use, 60 watts of electrical power, which is comparable to the power used in one ordinary table lamp, is enough to disinfect water at the rate of one ton per hour or 15 liters per minute. This much water is enough to meet the drinking water needs of a community of 2,000 people. This device Gajil developed for rural poor areas can run off of solar panels and weighs only 15 pounds and has no toxic discharge. Of course there is no silver bullet. While UV disinfection works very well for bacteria and viruses, it is less effective with other types of pollution such as suspended solids, turbidity, color, or soluble organic matter. In large-scale applications, UV is often combined with more standard treatments, such as chlorine, as is the case with the world's largest UV drinking water disinfection plant in New York, which can treat 2.2 billion U.S. gallons, 8,300,000 cubic meters per day. That is 3,029,500,000 cubic meters a year. The average person in the United States uses 2,842 cubic meters a year. This includes fresh water used for industrial purposes, not just for direct drinking consumption. The global average is 1,385 cubic meters per year. China, India, and the United States are currently the largest freshwater users in the world, and the majority of that water is used in production, mainly agriculture. In fact, about 70% of all fresh water is used for agriculture globally. For the sake of pure statistical argument, ignoring the highly needed revisions towards strategic water use, reuse systems, and conservation possibilities through more advanced and efficient industrial applications, let us assess the simple question of what it would require to disinfect, assuming it was needed, all the fresh water currently being used in the world on average by the population in all contexts. Given the global average of 1,385 cubic meters and a population of 7.2 billion, we arrive at a total annual use of 9.972 trillion cubic meters. Using the New York UV plant's output capacity of roughly 3 billion cubic meters a year as a base per installation of such a plant, we find that 3,327 plants would be needed globally. The New York plant is about 3.7 acres. This means about 12,309 acres of land is needed, in theory, to facilitate a purification process of all the fresh water currently used globally by the population. Of course, needless to say, there are many other footprint factors that come into play, such as power needs coupled with the critical importance of location. However, let's put this into a larger, more thoughtful comparison. The United States military alone, with its roughly 845,441 military buildings and bases, occupies about 30 million acres of land globally. Only 0.04% of that land would be needed to disinfect the total fresh water use of the entire world, if it were even needed at scale, which it is not. B. Desalination The realistic possibility of mass global purification of polluted fresh water aside, likely the most powerful means to assure usable potable water, is to convert directly from a saline source, namely the ocean. With a plant comprised of mostly salt water, this technique, if done properly, assures global abundance alone. 
The most common method of desalination used today is reverse osmosis, a process that removes water molecules from salt water, leaving salt ions in a leftover brine waste byproduct. According to the International Desalination Association, currently reverse osmosis accounts for nearly 60% of installed capacity followed by the thermal processes multi-stage flash MSF at 26% and multi-effect distillation. MED at 8.2 percent. As of 2011, there were roughly 16,000 desalination plants worldwide and the total global capacity of all plants online, e.g. in operation, was 66.5 million cubic meters per day or approximately 17.6 billion U.S. gallons per day. As with everything technological, many advancing methods currently considered experimental suggest a powerful increase in efficiency as the trends unfold. One such method called capacitive desalination CD, also known as capacitive deionization CDI, has been shown to operate with greater energy efficiency, lower pressures, no membrane components, and it does not produce a waste discharge like conventional practices. It can also be easily scaled up simply by increasing the number of flow electrodes in the system. Overall, if we examine the existing methods in general, coupled with emerging methods, we see a general trend of increasing efficiency in both power conservation and performance. That briefly noted, the focus of this extrapolation towards a post-scarcity utilization of desalination will consider only current proven in-use methods, namely the reverse osmosis system. The Wanthagi desalination plant is an advanced reversed osmosis seawater desalination plant on the Bass Coast near Wanthagi in south southern Victoria, Australia. It was completed in December 2012. It can produce conservatively about 410,000 cubic meters of desalinated water a day, 150 million cubic meters a year, while occupying about 20 hectares, about 50 acres of land. Since, as noted before, the total annual water use of the world today is about 9 trillion, 972 billion cubic meters, this means that it would take 60,000 plants to process all potable water use usage. Once again, this extreme extrapolation is to make a relative point since we do not need to desalinate that much water in reality. However, assuming that we did need to desalinate seawater constantly to match current global use, 3 million acres of land would be needed total. Earth has about 217,490 miles of coastline which means loosely using the Wanthagi model of roughly 20 hectares, roughly 50 acres, with 100 meters per hectare, or 328 feet, assuming the construction was 4 hectares deep and 5 hectares long, parallel to the coastline, the plant would take up 1,640 feet along the coast. This means, assuming 60,000 plants of the same dimension, it would take up 98,400,000 feet or 18,636 miles of coastline, 8.5% of the world's coastline. Of course, that is a great deal of coastline, and naturally many other factors come into play when choosing an appropriate location for such a plant. Again, it is not the purpose of this extrapolation to suggest these statistics are of any other use than to gauge a broad sense of what such capacity means, in light of the water scarcity stress issues occurring today. Yet the fact is, it is clearly within the range of such application to meet the needs of people suffering from water scarcity via desalination alone, coupled with an infrastructure and distribution system to move water inland. As a final example, let's reduce this abstract extrapolation more so and apply it to a real-life circumstance. On the continent of Africa, for example, which has about 1 billion people as of 2013, roughly 345 million people lack sufficient access to potable water. If we apply the noted global average consumption rate of 1,385 cubic meters a year. Seeking to provide each of those 345 million people that amount, we would need 477,825,000,000 cubic meters produced annually. 
Using the Wonthaggi annual capacity of 150 million cubic meters produced as the base figure, Africa would need 3,185 50 acre plants along its coastline to meet such demand taking up about 25,158 miles of coastline in Africa, 5,223,400 feet or 989 miles. This takes up only 3.9% of Africa's coastline. However, if we divided this number in half and used UV purification systems for one section and desalinization for the other, the desalinization process would need about 1.9% or 494 miles of coastline for desalination facilities and only about 296 acres of land for purification facilities, which is a minuscule fraction of Africa's total landmass of about 7 billion acres. This is highly doable and obviously in this case and in all cases we would strategically maximize purification processes since it is more efficient while using desalination for the remaining demand. Such crude statistics reveal that between UV and traditional decontamination coupled with traditional desalination processes as they currently exist, even ignoring the rapid advancements occurring in both fields, which will likely have an exponentially advanced level of efficiency in the coming decades, the idea of enduring water scarcity on planet Earth is absurd. Both of these isolated extrapolations have assumed only one or the other was applied in only large-scale form, assuming there are no other existing sources of potable water. In reality, given the existing level of fresh water still available, coupled with a simple, intelligent reordering of use-reuse water network schemes to further preserve the existing capacity, coupled with both large and small-scale desalination and decontamination processes as regions require, many of which can be powered by rapidly advancing renewable energy energy processes as well, we have the technical capacity to bring potable water availability to absolute global abundance. Energy. Renewable energy sources are sources that are continually replenished. Such sources include energy from water, wind, solar, and geothermal. In contrast, fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas are non-renewable as they are based on Earth's stores, which show no near-term regeneration. As of early 21st century, the recognition of clean, renewable energy possibilities has been substantial. The spectrum of application, scalability, and degree of efficiency, coupled with advancing methods for energy storage and transfer, have arguably made our current, mostly hydrocarbon-based energy methods appear outdated, especially given the ongoing negative consequences of their use. Nuclear energy, while effective and considered a renewable form by some, works at very high risk given the unstable materials involved and the large-scale accidents on record have brought the safety of this form of production into question as well. In the world today, the five most commonly used renewable sources are hydropower via dams, solar, wind, geothermal, and biofuels. Renewable energy sources currently represent about 15% of global energy use, with hydropower accounting for 97% of this figure. Given that over 1.2 billion people are without access to electricity worldwide, coupled with the ongoing pollution and periodic crises associated with traditional non-renewable methods, the purpose of this subsection is to show how the dangerous realities associated with fossil fuels and nuclear energy are no longer needed. We can now power the world many times over with clean, renewable, relatively low-impact methods, largely localized as per the needs of a single structure, city, or industrial application. However, it is important to point out up front that there is no single solution at this time. Given that different areas of the earth have different propensities for renewable energy, harnessing and use, application must be seen as a system or network development of a combination of mediums. That noted, narrowing down the most relevant of these abundance-producing possibilities, it is perhaps 
best to think of renewable energy extraction, harnessing, and use in two categories. A. Large scale slash base load and B. Small scale and total mixed use systems. A. Large scale slash base load. Large scale generation such as for base load needs required to power a city or high energy industrial center includes four main mediums. A1 geothermal plants, A2 wind farms, A3 solar fields, and A4 water, ocean slash hydropower. A1 geothermal. Geothermal power is energy harnessed essentially from the natural heat of the Earth's molten core, with plants usually placed around areas where the distance to large heat centers is fairly shallow. A 2006 MIT report on geothermal energy promoting an advanced extraction system called EGS found that 13,000 zettajoules of power are currently available in the Earth, with the possibility of 2,000 zettajoules being harvestable with improved technology. The total energy consumption of all the countries on the planet is about half a zettajoule, 0.55 a year. And this means thousands of years of planetary power could be harnessed in this medium alone. The MIT report also estimated that there was enough energy in hard rocks 10 kilometers below the U.S. alone to supply all the world's current needs for 30,000 years. Even with an expected 56% increase of consumption by 2040, geothermal's capacity is enormous if properly tapped. Likewise, the extraction of heat taking place from within the Earth appears quite minor in comparison to its store, making the source virtually limitless in proportion to actual human consumption. Also, since the energy is produced constantly, there are no intermittency problems, and this type of energy can be produced constantly without the need for storage. The environmental impact of geothermal is relatively very low. Iceland has been using it almost exclusively for some time, and their plants produce extremely low emissions, no carbon, when compared to hydrocarbon-based methods. Apart from some sulfur produced, small earthquakes can occur as a result of drilling techniques. This problem has been acknowledged as human-induced, and improvement in the engineering process is the solution, coupled with clear understanding of the nature of the location for drilling. As far as location, it is theoretically possible possible to place geothermal energy extraction plants anywhere if the capacity to drill deep enough was there, coupled with other advancements in technology. However, today most plants need to exist near where tectonic plates meet on Earth. A geothermal map of the surface of the Earth taken by satellite can show such ideal spots very clearly based on heat emitted. These maps show possibilities near most coastlines around the world, and while most studies are ambiguous with respect to exactly how many locations could be made available, the potential recognized in general is enormous. The U.S. Department of Energy has noted that geothermal energy also uses much less land than other energy sources, including fossil fuel and currently dominant renewables. Over 30 years, the period of time commonly used to compare the life cycle impacts from different power sources, a geothermal facility uses 404 meters squared of land per gigawatt hour, while a coal facility uses 3,632 meters squared per gigawatt hour. If we were to do a basic comparison of geothermal to coal given this ratio of meters squared to gigawatt hour, we find that we could fit about nine geothermal plants in the space of one coal plant. Likewise, it is important to note that new, more efficient methods to tap geothermal appear to be just starting with respect to possible output potential. In 2013, it was announced that a 1,000 megawatt power station was to begin construction in Ethiopia. A megawatt is a unit of power, and power capacity is expressed differently from energy capacity, which is expressed in this context of megawatts, as megawatt hours, MWH. Put another way, energy is the amount of work done, whereas power is the rate of doing work. So, for example, a generator with one MW capacity that operates at that capacity consistently for one hour will produce one megawatt hour of electricity, 
This means if a 1000 megawatt geothermal power station operated at full capacity 24 hours a day, 7 days a year, it would produce 8,760,000 megawatt hours per year. The world's current annual usage in megawatt hours is about 153 billion, which means it would take in abstraction 17,465 geothermal plants to match global use. According to the World Coal Association, there are over 2,300 coal power plants in operation worldwide. Using the aforementioned plant size slash capacity comparison of about nine geothermal plants fitting into one coal plant, the space of 1,940, or 84% of the total in existence, coal plants would be needed. In theory, to contain the 17,465 geothermal plants. Also, given coal today accounts for only 41% of the world's current energy production, this theoretical extrapolation also shows how, in 84% of the current space usage by coal plants alone, which only produce 41%, geothermal could supply 100% power capacity as per global use instead. All this without the pollution from coal, which has has been considered one of the most polluting practices in the world along with being likely the largest contributor to the human-made increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Wind Farms U.S. Department of Energy studies have concluded that wind harvesting in the Great Plains states of Texas, Kansas, and North Dakota could provide enough electricity to power the entire USA. More impressively, a 2005 Stanford University study published in the Journal of Geophysical Research found that if only 20% of the wind potential on the planet was harnessed, it would cover the entire world's energy needs. In corroboration, two more recent studies by unrelated organizations published in 2012 calculated that with existing wind turbine technology, the Earth could produce hundreds of trillions of watts of power. This, in effect, is many more times what the world currently consumes. Wind power is perhaps one of the most simple and low-impact forms of renewable energy, and its scalability is limited only to location. Using the 9,000-acre Alta Wind Energy Center, California, as a basis, which has an active capacity of 1,320 megawatts of power, a theoretical annual output of 11,563,200 megawatt hours is possible. This means that 13,231 9,000 acre wind farms would be needed to meet the current output figure of 153 billion megawatt hours. This means 119,079,000 acres of wind-sufficient land would be required. This amounts to 0.3% of the Earth's surface that would be needed to power the world in abstraction. Once again, this is not to suggest such a thing is ideal, given what land is feasible for wind farms, along with other important factors. This is simply to give a general perspective of possibility. However, one unique reality of wind power generation is the potential of offshore harnessing. Compared to land-based wind power, offshore wind power has, on average, a much larger yield as wind speeds tend to be higher. This reality also alleviates land-based pressures, given land scarcity and regional restrictions. According to the Assessment of Offshore Wind Energy Resources for the United States, 4,150 gigawatts 4,150,000 megawatts of potential wind turbine capacity from offshore wind resources are available in the United States. Assuming this power capacity was consistent for a year, we end up with an energy conversion of 36,354,000,000 megawatt hours a year, given the United States in 2010 used 25,776 terawatt hours of energy, we find that offshore wind harvesting 
alone exceeds national use by about 10.6 billion megawatt hours, or 41 percent. Intuitively, extrapolating this national level of capacity to the rest of the world's coastlines, also taking into account the aforementioned land-based only statistic research that found we can power the world many times over onshore as well, the possibilities of wind-based energy abundance is exceptionally impressive. Solar Fields The upper atmosphere of Earth receives about 1.5 times 1,021 watt-hours of solar radiation annually. This vast amount of energy is more than 23,000 times that used by the human population of the planet. If humanity could capture one-tenth of one percent of the solar energy striking the Earth, we would have access to six times as much energy as we consume in all forms today with almost no greenhouse gas emissions. The ability to harness this power depends on the technology and how high the percentage of radiation absorption is. Conventional photovoltaics, currently the most common form used mostly for smaller applications, use silicon as the semiconductor and exist in something of a flat cell or sheet. Concentrated photovoltaics, CPV, are generally more efficient than non-concentrated on average. However, they tend to require more direct exposure to focus the light properly. Concentrated solar power, CPS, is a large-scale approach that uses mirrors or lenses to concentrate a large area of sunlight or solar thermal energy onto a small area. Electrical power is produced when the concentrated light is converted to heat, which drives a heat engine, such as a steam turbine, connected to an electrical power generator or the like. Unlike photovoltaics, which convert directly to electricity, this technology converts to heat. Recently, large-scale storage methods have also been used to prolong access at night. A variation of CPS is STE, or solar thermal energy. The Ivanpah Solar Electric Generating System in California, USA is a 3,500-acre field with a stated annual generation of 1,079,232 megawatt-hours. While Ivanpah does not use any form of storage, it serves about 140,000 homes in the region. If we were to extrapolate using Ivanpah as a basis, it would take 141,767 fields, or 496,184,500 acres, to theoretically meet current global energy use based on output. This is 1.43% of total land on Earth. Once again, this is not to suggest such a thing is practical, nor is it to ignore the radiation yield differences found on different areas of the Earth. However, deserts, which tend to be highly conducive for solar fields, while often less conducive to life support for people, are roughly one-third of all the land mass in the world, or about 12 billion acres compared to the roughly 500 million acres theoretically needed to power the world as per our extrapolation. Only 4.1 percent of the world's desert land would be needed. Likewise, other projects similar to the Ivanpah field have been incorporating storage systems. The Solana 280 megawatt solar power plant in Arizona combines parabolic trough mirror technology with molten salt thermal storage and is able to continue outputting up to six hours after the sky goes dark. In general, the rate of advancement of photovoltaic, solar thermal, storage methods, and other existing and emerging technologies continue to rapidly advance, revealing that many installations seen as highly efficient today will be grossly inefficient in a decade or two as will be addressed more so with respect to smaller scale renewable energy solutions, the use of solar power localized in the very construction of buildings and domiciles is likely to be where true future efficiency will take place. The issue is making the technology compact and efficient enough for localized per case use. However, solar field power stations just like geothermal and wind have an enormous global potential in and of themselves and there is little doubt that given proper resources and attention, these fields alone could theoretically establish an infrastructure and efficiency level to power the world alone. 
Water slash hydro energy. Water-based renewable energy extraction could generally be said to have two broad sources. The ocean itself and river type water flows which use the gravitational force of falling or flowing water, usually in an inland water course. The latter is generally referred to in practice as hydroelectric and as noted before it is currently a fairly large part of the existing renewable energy infrastructure. On the other hand, the vast potential of the ocean has yet to be harnessed within a fraction of its capacity. It is not far-fetched to suggest that the intelligent harvesting of both the various mechanical movements of ocean water coupled with exploiting the differences in heat known as ocean thermal energy conversion or OTEC that ocean water power couldn't also power the world alone given the existing fairly large-scale use of hydroelectric power dams already this section will instead focus on the ocean potentials the most pronounced sea-based potentials at this time appear to be wave, tidal, ocean, current, ocean thermal, and osmotic. Waves are primarily caused by winds. Tides are primarily caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. Ocean currents are primarily caused by the rotation of the earth. Ocean thermal results from solar heat absorbed by the surface of the ocean, and osmotic power is when fresh water and salt water meet, exploiting the difference in salt concentration. Wave. It has been found that wave power's usable global potential is about 3 terawatt or about 26,280 terawatt hour per year, assuming constant harnessing. This is almost 20% of current global use. This amount of power has been ascertained essentially by analyzing deep water regions off continent coastlines. The theoretical power estimate has been estimated at 3.7 terawatts, with the final net estimate reduced by about 20% to compensate for various inefficiencies related to a given region, such as ice coverage. Energy output is basically determined by wave height, wave speed, wave length, and water density. Wave farms, or the construction of wave harnessing plants off a coastline, have seen limited large-scale application at this time, with only about six countries sparsely applying the technology. Locations with the most potential include the western seaboard of Europe, the northern coast of the UK, and the Pacific coastlines of North and South America, Southern Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Different locations of Earth have large differences in range. In the United Kingdom, an area with high levels of tidal activity, dozens of sites are currently noted as available, forecasting that 34% of all the UK's energy could come from tidal power alone. Globally, older studies have put tidal capacity at 1,800 terawatt hours a year. More recent studies have put the theoretical capacity, both range and stream, at 3 terawatts, assuming only a portion would be extractable. Tidal, while very predictable, is also subject to daily periods of intermittency based around tidal shifts. Assuming only 1.5 terawatt could be harnessed in a year based on advanced technology, this means about 7% of the world's power could come from tidal. Ocean Current Similar to tidal streams, ocean currents have shown great potential. These currents flow consistently in the open ocean and various emerging technologies have been developing to harness this largely untapped medium. As with all renewables, the capacity to harness such potential is directly related to the efficiency of the technology employed. The EOEA estimates the current potential at 400 terawatt hour per year. However, there is good reason to assume this figure is outdated. Prior applications of turbine mill technologies to capture such water flows have needed an average current of 5 or 6 knots to operate efficiently while most of the Earth's currents are slower than 3 knots. However, recent developments have revealed the possibility to harness energy from water flows of less than 2 knots. Given this potential, it has been suggested that ocean current alone could power the entire world.
the Gulf Stream potential has been estimated at 13 gigawatts of actual output, assuming a 30% conversion efficiency using more traditional turbine technology. This means 13,000 megawatts, or assuming constant harnessing of the stream all year, about 113,880,000 megawatt hours a year. The United States in 2011 is estimated to have used 4.1 billion megawatt hours in electricity. This means 30% of the U.S.'s electrical consumption could be generated by the Gulf Stream alone. Once again, this is assuming the use of only established technology. Osmotic Osmotic power, or salinity gradient power, is the energy available from the difference in the salt concentration between seawater and river water. The Norwegian Center for Renewable Energy, SFFE, estimates the global potential to be about 1,370 terawatt-hours per year, with others putting it at around 1,700 terawatt-hours per year or the equivalent of half of Europe's entire energy demand. While still largely in its infancy, osmotic power harnessing through advancing technology is promising. Power plants can, in principle, be built anywhere fresh water meets seawater. They can generate power 24-7 regardless of weather conditions. Ocean Thermal the final ocean-based means for energy harnessing worth noting is Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, OTEC. Exploiting the differences in heat existing around the surface of the ocean and below, warmer surface water is used to heat a fluid, such as liquid ammonia, converting it into vapor, which expands to drive a turbine, which in turn produces electricity. The fluid is then cooled using cold water from the ocean depths, returning it into a liquid state so the process can start all over again. Of all the ocean-based energy sources, OTEC appears to have the most potential. It has been estimated that 88,000 terawatt-hours per year could be generated without affecting the ocean's thermal structure. While this figure may not express total usable capacity, it implies that well over half of all current global energy consumption could be met with OTEC alone. As of 2013, most of the existing OTEC plants are experimental or very small scale. However, a few major industrial capacity projects have been set in motion, including a 10 megawatt plant off the coast of China and a 100 megawatt near Hawaii. One 100 megawatt offshore plant can theoretically power Hawaii's entire Big Island alone, meaning 186,000 people as of a 2011 census. Now, in conclusion to this subsection of ocean energy harnessing, keeping consistent with the prior categorical estimations set forward for solar, wind, and geothermal, it is worthwhile to consider the total combined, largely conservative potential of each noted medium. While this will, of course, be a crude extrapolation, since there are many complex variables, including the fact that some applications are still semi-experimental and difficult to properly assess, this general figure still helps to digest the broadest perspective of the potential of ocean renewables. Here is a list of the noted global potentials. Wave, 27,280 terawatt hours per year. Tidal, 13,140 terawatt hours per year, or 1.5 terawatts times 8,760 hours. Ocean current, 400 terawatt hours per year. Old estimate with old tech. Osmotic, approximately 1,500 terawatt hours per year, average of noted statistics. Ocean thermal, 88,000 terawatt hours per year. Added together, we arrive at 130,320 terawatt hours per year, or 0.46 zettajoules a year. This is roughly 83% of current global use, 0.55 zettajoules. 
It is important to note that such numbers are derived in part from traditional technologies with no adjustment made for more recent improvements. If we bring traditional hydroelectric watercourse based back into the equation, which according to the IEA has a potential of 16,400 terawatt hours per year, this brings the figure up to 146,720 terawatt hours per year or 96% of current global use. Small-scale and total mixed-use systems. The prior section described the vast potentials of large-scale baseload renewable energy harnessing. Wind, solar, water-slash-hydro, and geothermal have all shown that they are capable individually of meeting or vastly exceeding the current 0.55 zettajoule annual global energy consumption at this time. The true question is how are such methods to be intelligently put into practice? Given the regional limitations coupled with other native issues such as intermittency, the real design initiative to create a workable combination of such means is needed. Such a systems approach is the real solution, harmonizing an optimized fraction of each of those renewables to achieve global total use abundance. For example, it is not inconceivable to imagine a series of man-made floating islands off select coastlines which are designed to possibly harness at once wind, solar, thermal difference, wave, tidal, and ocean currents, all at the same time and in the same general area. Such energy islands would then pipe their harvest back to land for human use. Various combinations could also be applied to land-based systems as well, such as constructing wind-solar combinations to complement the fact that often wind is more present at night while solar is more present during the day. Likewise, creative ingenuity with respect to how we can intelligently combine various methods also extends to what we could consider localized energy harnessing. Smaller scale renewable methods that are conducive to single structures or small areas find the same systems logic regarding combination. These localized systems could also, if need be, connect back into the larger baseload systems as well, revealing a total mixed medium integrated network. A common example today is the use of single structure solar panels such as for home use. While the efficiency of these panels is still improving coupled with imposed cost limitations as per the investment slash profit mechanism of the market, most people utilizing these solar power systems are only able to complement their home's electricity use rather than gain 100 percent utilization. For example, most systems are applied to power the home during the day while pulling power from the regional baseload grid at night. This kind of approach that seeks to maximize localized possibilities first before resorting to larger scale energy use in a system approach is the key to practical energy abundance, efficiency, and sustainability. To understand the relevance of this more thoroughly, let's expand the example of household solar array application to its possible theoretical potential. In 2011, the average annual electricity consumption for a U.S. residential utility household customer was 11,280 kilowatt hours, given 114,800,000 households in 2010. This means 1,295 terawatt hours a year was used. Total electrical energy consumption in 2012 for the USA was 3,886,400,000 megawatt hours a year. This equates to 3,886 terawatt hours per year. This means 33% of all electric consumption occurred in people's homes, with the vast majority of that energy coming from fossil fuel power stations. If all households in the United States were able to power themselves for electricity using solar panels alone, localized energy utilization that is simply wasted at this time, the baseload stress reduction would be dramatic. 
Contrary to popular belief, as of 2013, this is a real possibility, given the state of solar cell efficiency and storage technology. The problem is that the current energy industry is not prepared for such efficiency, and consumer solar systems available suffer from high financial expense as a result of limited mass production, competition, and a lack of social initiative to forward advancement. It's worth stating here that the financial system and its price-oriented mechanisms exist as barriers to ubiquitous and optimized household solar development in the broad view, along with every other developing technology after a certain point of proven efficacy. While defenders of capitalism argue that the process of investment to market of an in-demand good generally reduces the cost of that good over time, making it more available to those who could not afford it before, it is forgotten that the entire process is a contrivance. If price and profit were removed from the system, focusing only on the technology and its statistical merit, both at the current time and its longer-term efficiency trends, future improvements, proper resource allocation strategies and research could be employed to bring promising technology to the population much more rapidly. In the case of solar arrays for home power generation, given the incredible capacity it has to alleviate baseload energy stress, which would today further reduce emissions and fossil fuel pollution, it is a very unfortunate circumstance this technology and its application is subject to the whims of the market. If we survey the commercial expense of an average solar array as of 2013, an average home using 11,280 kilowatt hours a month would require about 30 panels with a solar cell efficiency of about 9 to 15 percent and a nighttime battery system. This would cost well over $20,000. Such an expense is unaffordable for the vast majority of the world, even though the basic materials used in the traditional PV these systems are simple and abundant, along with ever-increasing manufacturing ease. Likewise, it is equally as disappointing to notice how modern home construction has made little to no use of other basic, localized renewable methods that can further facilitate the real-world capacity to bring all households, not only in the USA, but in the world, to a place of energy independence. Noting the power of solar, other nearly universal applications also apply. Small wind harvesting systems and geothermal heating and cooling technology, combined with architectural design making better use of natural light and heat-slash-cool preservation efficiency, there is a spectrum of design adjustments which could make apartments and houses not only self-sufficient but more ecologically sustainable. Coupling this with use reuse designs for water preservation, along with other approaches to optimize energy-slash-resource efficiency, it is clear that our current methods are enormously wasteful when compared to the possibilities. Extending outwards to city infrastructure, we see the same failures almost everywhere with respect to such applied systems. For example, an enormous amount of energy is used in the process of transportation. While the electric vehicle has proven viable for full global use, even though lobbying efforts and other market limitations have continued to keep its application well behind the gasoline-powered norm, many system-based methods also go unharnessed. Apart from a general necessity to reorganize urban environments to be more conducive to convenient mass transit networks, removing the need for numerous autonomous vehicles, simply reharnessing the powered movements of all transport mediums could dramatically alleviate energy pressures. A technology called piezoelectric, which is able to convert pressure and mechanical energy into electricity, is an excellent example of an energy reuse method with great potential. Existing applications have included power generation by people walking on piezo-engineered floors and sidewalks, streets which can generate power as automobiles cross over them, and train rail systems, which can also capture energy from passing train cars through pressure. Aerospace engineer Haim 
Abramovich has stated that a stretch of road less than a mile long, four lanes wide, and trafficked by about 1,000 vehicles per hour can create about 4 megawatts of power, enough to power 600 homes. Other theoretical applications extend to pretty much anything that engages pressure or action, including minor vibrations. For example, there are projects working to harness the seemingly small-scale energy production, such as texting on a cell phone in an effort to charge the phone while the phone is simply being touched or moved, applications to harvest energy from airflow from airplanes, and even an electric car that uses piezo tech in part to charge its Itself as it travels. If we think about the enormous mechanical energy wasted by vehicle transport modes and high traffic walking centers, such as downtown streets, the potential of that possible regenerated energy is quite substantial. It is this type of systems thinking that is needed in order to maintain sustainability while actively pursuing a global energy abundance. Material production slash access. Unlike the prior three subsections, which have taken only existing established methods into consideration with respect to humanity's potential to achieve an abundance of each given focus, this section will necessarily be approached differently. The problem with creating a basis for an overall material abundance extrapolation in a similar manner, taking into account general raw materials, is that the level of industrial revision needed to embrace the high degree of efficiency sought is radically different from current traditional practices. In other words, we cannot definitively extrapolate in the same way using an existing singular process or genre technology in order to draw such a conclusion about the level of productivity possible on the whole. This is because the true abundance generating efficiency mechanism is to be found in the large scale system orientation, taking into account the synergy present between the sustainability laws inherent to the natural world and the level of efficiency incorporated within the entire societal operation. For example, today there are over 1 billion automobiles in the world. From a narrow view, the idea of an abundance of automobiles would perhaps imply, based on the current property-oriented framework, that every human being on the planet should then own a private automobile. Put bluntly, this is the wrong perspective and an outgrowth of a non-synergetic conditioning which is common to the market system's reinforcement of property as value. From the standpoint of efficiency and sustainability, it is extremely wasteful to employ one automobile per person due to the fact that a person actually only drives, on average, only about 5% of the time. Otherwise, the automobile sits in parking lots, driveways, and the like. In the city of Los Angeles, California, about 1,977,803 automobiles are reported as in use as of 2009. In abstraction, based on this use time average of 5%, only 98,890 automobiles would actually be needed to meet the transport time needs of the current use demand, assuming a sharing system. In other words, in principle, only 98,890 automobiles would be needed to meet the transport needs of 1,977,803 people. Furthermore, for the sake of argument, with all other modes of public transport ignored, and with the entire population of Los Angeles, 3.9 million people, needing to be mobile for 5% a month, only 195,000 automobiles would be needed in abstraction to meet the average use time of 3.9 million people. Likewise, in the United States, in 2008, it was recorded that 236.4 million consumer vehicles were being used. With a U.S. population of 313 million, using the 5% use statistic once again, it would take 15.6 million automobiles to meet use demand. That is an 83% decrease in automobile output to meet the needs of all Americans, a 32.4% increase in use or access based on total population in theory. 
Of course, please note that it is well acknowledged here that such an extrapolation is merely for speculation, as obviously many other complicating factors come into play in real life that would adjust this equation greatly. The point here is to give the reader a sense of synergy. What should be pointed out is the noted increase in efficiency where substantially fewer automobiles are needed to meet the transport needs of substantially more people due to a system-based synergetic reorientation, in this case a car sharing system. Again, this is not to dismiss the need for improved urban or public transport, nor does it address the importance of an automobile's design. At the root of the issue is really the subject of transportation itself, the reasons why people need such mobility, and how the environment is designed to cater for or bypass such needs. This is an enormous dynamic subject to consider. Also, let it be stated up front that no matter what real or assumed efficiencies may exist in real life, the goal of seeking post-scarcity as both a means to relieve human suffering and as a method to adapt to truly efficient and hence sustainable practices is without debate as a critical point of focus for an expanding society. It could be well argued that only a perverse society would willfully choose to persevere with a system that knowingly preserves scarcity for profit and establishment preservation when it is intellectually clear that such a condition is no longer needed and hence any such related human suffering resulting is also no longer needed. As argued prior, the market economy is not just a response to a scarcity-based worldview it is also a preserver of it. The market structurally requires a high degree of scarcity as an abundance focused society would eventually mean less labor for income, less turnover, and less profit on the whole. If society woke up tomorrow to a world where 50 percent of the human job market was automated and where all food, energy, and basic goods could be made available without a price tag due to increased efficiency, needless to say, the job market and monetary economy as we know it would collapse. Value Shift in order to think properly about the state of our productive capacity to produce life-supporting and standard-of-living improving goods today, we need to first rationally separate human needs from human wants, with the priority of meeting needs first. While this distinction may appear like a controversial opinion to many, in a world where now 46% of the total wealth is owned by 1% of the population, in a world where roughly 1 billion do not get basic nutrition, in a world where 1.1 billion people live without clean drinking water, and 2.6 billion people lack adequate sanitation, in a world where 100 million people do not have shelter, in a world where 3 billion live on less than 250 a day, and in a world where 1.2 billion do not even have electricity. Electricity. Perhaps our priorities as a global civilization need to be addressed with respect to the true maintenance of what we might questionably term civilization. The truth is, this priority is not a mere poetic gesture, it is a public health requirement. The process of our physical and psychological evolution has created human needs. Not meeting these virtually empirical needs results in a destabilizing spectrum of physical, mental, and social disorders. Human wants, on the other hand, are cultural manifestations that have undergone enormous subjective change over time, revealing something of an arbitrary nature in truth. Now this isn't to say neurotic attachments can't manifest into wants, so much so that they start to take the role of needs emotionally. However, that is still mostly a cultural condition. Sadly, again, the market does not separate needs from wants in its basic psychology, which is why scarcity arguments can be extended infinitely in defense of its existence and hence the proposed need to have a competitive trade-based society no matter the degree of abundance that can be achieved. This has arguably created a type of neurosis, in fact, where people assume having infinite wants and more and more is a virtue or even a driver of human progress itself. Of course, infinite possibilities are certainly a reality in many ways, as society cannot predict what technology will materialize many years down the line, as influences change and preferences change.
However, infinite possibility is about vulnerability and creativity. While still being strategic and intelligent about resource management and use, this is not the same as infinite wants which sees the human being as insatiable and indiscriminate. Therefore, part of this value shift will be undoing the sociological damage done by the psychology inherent to market-based living. A relatively high standard of living can be made available for all human beings, assuming in part a basic, responsible value shift away from our troubling patterns of wasteful, frivolous acquisition. It is important to restate that the materialism we endure as a society today is a direct response to the economic need to keep money circulating as much as possible. The role of business as we know it is either to service people's existing wants slash needs or to invent them in the hope people will conform by showing new demand. A new widget put forward by the market is only as viable as the interest of others to purchase it, and the use of advertising and marketing has been very influential in creating a culture which sees ownership and acquisition as a sign of social status. This directly assists the need to keep high levels of consumerism in play as GDP and employment are directly related to this pressure. Again, the less interest there is to consume, the less economic growth, and hence less demand for jobs. This slows the existing state of a market economy and creates a systemic loss of well-being for many. It can be well argued that a culture which has decided that acquisition and expansion is the path of progress slash success, promoting constant consumption and seemingly infinite economic growth, is going to eventually hit the limits of sustainability on a finite planet. In clear terms, this trend is one of disorder. Social success and progress can only mean, in part, finding balance with the habitat and the other human beings who share the habitat. Sadly, the market system's entire premise contradicts this sustainable value. As the mechanism of economic unfolding does not reward conservation and the reduction of consumption in a direct sense, Put another way, the market is a scarcity-based structural approach that paradoxically seeks increased levels of consumption to operate efficiently. So, an analysis of our material capacity to bring common goods into a post-scarcity abundance to exceed the needs of all humans on Earth cannot be discussed without also understanding necessary sustainability-oriented revisions, which will substantially reduce our resource use footprint at the same time. In short, the new industrial design approach is to deliberately increase the performance per unit of how we use our resources, seeking to always move along the route of doing more with less. Within this logic, as noted, a series of pressure alleviations toward increased sustainability and production simplification slash efficiency would occur.